Hey, Frank and Arlo. Grandpa coming to you from the Big Easy, New Orleans. Woohoo! Home of Paradise Park. But I'm not here to tell you about New Orleans. I'm here to take you back 40 years to my first night of active police work. Now, I went to the police academy for, I think, four, maybe six months. I think I started in April and came out in October. So in October of 19... 81, 41 years ago. I was getting ready to, to, to walk my first beat. When we were in the police academy, I hung out with some people, Joe Cleary, Bill Borbage, Billy Walls, uh, Bill Calarulo, and then a couple of the women cops hung out, but not, not that much. But we were kind of buddies, and, and we hung out all the time, Joe Cleary. And Joe sat next to me in the police academy, Clark Cleary. That's how they set us up. So I had uh, Jeannie Carruthers on one side of me, Pat Bradley in front of me, uh, Billy Colarulo, Joe Cleary to the left of me. Cleary then Colorado. So we got to know each other pretty well because we we're in this class for a long time doing stuff. And we had ideas about what it was going to be like to go out on the patrol. <clears throat> we knew that we could wind up getting killed. I mean, it's that kind of job. It's like going into the military. You go in the police department, they give you a gun. And the reason they give you a gun is because you may have to use it. And the reason you may have to use it is because maybe the bad guy has one. A bang, bang, shooty. So we tried to act like we weren't scared and talked about what we were going to do, all the arrests we were going to make, what heroes we were going to be. But then it got down to the end and we started thinking, ooh, I wonder what it's really going to be like out there. So we graduated, we had a party, it was a great time. <clears throat> The night before, Joe and I, who had been put into the same district, and then the district put us into the, into the same crew, the, the same shift together, the squad, I think is what we called them. So we were on one squad in the 17th district. We were gonna work four to 12 shift, four in the afternoon till midnight. The station was located at 20th and Federal in South Philadelphia. Not a nice neighborhood. Not a nice neighborhood at all. So the day before we went, <clears throat> Joe and I got into one of our cars and we drove to the district and drove around. There were, there's an area called the bottom that's just like ghetto. There was the projects, and then there was 30th and, and Wharton, which is total chaos, white people chaos. <clears throat> Fights all the time and all kinds of crime going on. And we, were, we went, whoa, <laughs> stuff got real. So now I had some apprehensions, but I had put all this time into it and I thought, oh, I can do this. I'll learn how to do it. Because I'm not a hero. Never was, never will be. I show up the first day with Joe. We drove in together because we lived close to each other. And they put him on a wagon with somebody. And they said to me, <clears throat> excuse me, Clark, you're going to walk the, the Point Breeze Avenue beat. Okay. They said, Officer Savage over here is going to describe what you should and shouldn't do. Just listen to what he tells you. And you have a radio. If you think you need help, don't be a hero. Don't try to solve the problem yourself because there's a whole bunch of us. 
that are minutes away that can come and help you solve any problem. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. I go over and I talk to Ralph Savage, who was this really cool guy. He, he had some years on, knew what he was doing. And he said, Clarky, you own that street. You own Point Breeze Avenue. And the reason is, is because there's plenty of good people who live near or on Point Breeze Avenue and they need protection. You're not gonna meet a lot of those people unless they need help, but they're there. But the people that you're gonna run into all the time are the people that you're protecting those good folks from. They're the bad guys out on the street, wandering around all day, all night, never up to any good. And you need to let them know that you own that street, that it's yours. Now, people are gonna try to test you in a couple ways. You need to win those battles right up front. One thing is never look away when somebody's looking at you. Always look right at them until they look away from you. It might take a little while because they're testing you, but eventually you'll pass the test and they'll go like, nah, it's not worth it. And they'll look away because they know what the test is. But more important than that, never get out of anybody's way. You're not being a bully or anything. You're an authority figure. You represent the law. The law doesn't get out of anybody's way. So when you're walking down the street, people are gonna walk directly towards you to see what you're gonna do. And if you politely step out of the way of them, they got your number and they'll make your life hell. And trust me, it may or may not happen tonight, but you'll be tested in both of these ways at some point in time. So go out there. Remember what Lieutenant Sassy said. You have a radio. Call us if you need us. So I went, thanks, Ralph. That's great. And I set out the door made a left and started down Point Breeze Avenue. <clears throat> Maybe five minutes later, there was a gentleman, and I use that term sparingly, coming towards me, directly towards me. And I could see, even though he was a little ways down the street, that he was big, really big. As he got closer, I could tell that he was dirty, really dirty. And he was still coming towards me. And I noticed that he was staring straight at me. He got closer and closer. And I said, well, I've got to just maintain walking down the street so all my focus went into, I'm very, very scared. This, this is somebody big and mean looking. I hope he doesn't take my gun and shoot me with it. Cause he looked like the kind of person who could easily do that. We got closer and closer. And I realized that he was not gonna stop looking at me and he was not gonna get out of my way. He was just gonna come straight at me. So as we got closer, I slowed down so that when he got up to me, I was standing there. And he had to make a decision whether he was gonna walk around me or if he was gonna keep coming and hit me. And he came right up into my face and he was looking at me like this. And I mustered all my courage I must have sounded like this guy named Don Knotts who, who played 
uh, Barney Fife on Mayberry RFD. He was this scared sheriff's deputy. Going, <laughs> they let him have one gun to put in his bullet, or to one one bullet to put in his gun, and I think it was a rubber bullet because they were afraid if he shot it, he would kill the wrong people. And I felt like that. I could just tell. I was so nervous. And this guy was right in my face. And now we're standing there looking at each other. I didn't realize it then, but everybody around now was watching. The entire street came to a stop. And it was a busy street. It had stores on it, uh, little, what you'd call a cafe today, little restaurant type places, Chinese restaurants, those kind of things. And corner stores. And I mustered up all my courage. And I said, listen, MFR. You might think that you're tougher than me. And maybe you are. But only one of us has a stick and a gun. So you tell me, what do you want me to do? Shoot you or beat you? And then I just let the ball go into his court, as they say. And all of a sudden he went, Wah! Wah! I, I thought that I was gonna die. He ran around in back of me and he took off down the street. And I didn't notice where he was going because I was just happy that he was gone. Now at this point in time, I noticed that everybody there was watching me. But as soon as this guy screamed and ran around me and they noticed that I was looking at them watching me, they just, you know, hey, nothing to see here. And they just all walked away. And I thought, this is pretty cool. I got this. Yeah. But I didn't realize it was going to be that intense. Ralph Savage didn't say they come walking right up to you like that. That's insane. A couple minutes later, I hear them calling me on my walkie talkie. So I'm like 17 beat one. They said, take headquarters. 17 beat one, Roger. Hmm. They were going to tell me to take a message to somebody or do another detail or whatever. Walk another beat. So I'm zippity doo da, walking down the street. I, I go into the into the station and Lieutenant Sassy's there. He goes, uh, Officer Clark, did you just have a conversation with a citizen? And I went, well, kind of. And he said, did you threaten to beat and kill that citizen? And I said, well, not really. And he said, by not really, would you elaborate on that? What not really, that you didn't really threaten to kill him and beat him? And I said, well, I gave him a choice. And he said, that was crazy Willie. He's crazy. Everybody knows he's crazy, but now he's crazy at another level. We've never seen him this crazy. He's afraid of you. He thinks you're gonna hunt him down and kill him. Well, I explained, look, this is what they told me happened and I took it literally and everything worked out. I fortunately never ran into Crazy Willie again. I don't know what they told him, but I lived to fight another day. And um, I guess the moral of this, because I didn't write one into it, is that you never know what's gonna happen to you when you go to work or when you go out the front door to do something, go jogging, walk to the store, and you're never going to be ready for everything that happens to you. 
But if you're in a job that requires training, take that training seriously. The formal training, which I had had for 20 weeks or whatever the, the police academy was, and the informal training by the mentors provided at your work, the people who have way more experience than you do, and follow the advice they give you. And maybe you won't run into a crazy willy, but if you do, maybe you'll live through it. Peace out, guys.